The Royal National Park is up there as one of my favourite spots in the entire Greater Sydney region. What a truly, truly beautiful piece of nature that sits not even an hour's drive from Sydney. But did you know that once upon a time you could catch the train to the Royal National Park? This is the story of the Royal National Park Railway Line and the Sydney Tramway Museum who have done something truly magical with the former railway line. Before I continue, massive shout out to my monthly Kofi supporters. Please do consider supporting me over on Kofi if you can. Also, please subscribe if you haven't already, and do be sure to check out the rest of my channel, your go-to YouTube destination for all things city planning, after the video. The Royal National Park was declared on the 26th of April 1879, and it's believed to be only the second national park in the world, the first being Yellowstone in America. Now, being only the second national park in the world, I guess the importance of conservation was somewhat lost on those managing the park, as they used to allow the military to go out and practice their artillery skills in an uninhabited location. When the Illawarra Line was extended to Waterfall on the 9th of March 1886, a short branch to the Royal National Park was opened as well. It was built largely to accommodate this military traffic. The line diverged from the main line just south of Loftus, before passing over the Prince's Highway via a level crossing. Then it entered the bush, snaking its way down south to another level crossing at Lady Rawson Avenue, which has long since been reduced to a walking track. The railway ended at the bottom of a massive valley, just before the Port Hacking River, where it arrived at the Royal National Park station platform. This was the only station on the line, and it was in fact originally called Loftus, with the station that's now called Loftus called Loftus Junction. In 1896, it was renamed National Park, and Loftus Junction was renamed Loftus. Then it was renamed the National Park in 1934, then on Queen Elizabeth's visit in 1954, the Royal National Park, and finally in 1979, just Royal National Park. My lord, they really couldn't make up their mind. The line was only single track. Initially, steam trains ran to the park, but the line was electrified surprisingly early, in 1926, the very first year of electric trains in Sydney. From 1956, services ran from every station on the city circle to the Royal National Park. How crazy is that, being able to get all the way to the Royal National Park from pretty much any station in Sydney CBD? So the Royal National Park station used to be an island platform. Two tracks either side of the platform, and it also had three sidings. What was the station used for? Well, military purposes, yes, but also for normal citizens keen to have a nice little picnic in the National Park. Not too dissimilar to those who visit the Royal National Park today. People would arrive at the National Park, alight and hike or catch a bus down the honeymoon track to Audley, where they could do any number of recreational activities, from going out on the Hacking River on a boat, to playing tennis. Now, there was a sort of station at the location of a Boy Scouts corroboree, which was held in 1946. Really, it was just a platform, informally known as the Scouts platform. It's long since been demolished. All the footage you've seen thus far is of the new station platform. The old island station platform, which you can see in this picture, went out of use in 1978, and was replaced by a new platform with a single track in 1979, the platform you can see here. This was done to make space for the new offices of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. The station continued to be serviced throughout the 80s, with up to six trains a day running along the new eastern suburbs and Illawarra line from here to Bondi Junction, instead of the city circle as it did before. Despite all of this, the Royal National Park branch line was declining in usage. Quite simply put, the motor car was just far too convenient for people to use, and taking a train to the Royal National Park was proving to be too much of an in inconvenience. Therefore, patronage on the Royal National Park branch line declined, and the death knell was about to sound for the line. The line just wasn't being used by enough people to justify its continued existence. Branch lines such as this are complicated to schedule around, since it means that a train has to service a branch instead of the main line. 
every time a train ran down to the Royal National Park, instead of down the main line towards Waterfall. Those at the busiest stations south of Loftus, such as at Engadine and Waterfall, missed out on a service. As it was, towards the end of its life, the station was averaging only three people per train. The line somehow remained open until 1991, but then that was that. The line actually closed unexpectedly. A signalling malfunction occurred in June 1991, and it was found that it would cost a massive $400,000 to upgrade the signals and the track and repair everything. That's far too much money for a line that barely anyone was using. The final train had run on the 11th of June 1991, before the malfunction, without anyone even knowing that that would be the final train. The branch officially closed on the 9th of September 1991, and alas, it was doomed to forever remain lost to time. Kidding! It hasn't remained lost to time, because now I can tell you about the heroes of this story, the Sydney Tramway Museum. The Sydney Tramway Museum opened in 1950. From 1957, it was located on the edge of the Royal National Park. Then it moved to its current location next to Loftus Railway Station in 1988. The museum is an entirely non-profit community organisation, run entirely by volunteers. One of those volunteers is Reg, who was a big help in research for this video. He kindly donated me these photos of some of the trams that the Tramway Museum own. I've linked his YouTube channel in the top right. Oh, and check out the Tramway Museum's Facebook page for upcoming events and tram nostalgia. Over the years, the museum has collected some very impressive pieces of history. For example, there's the Railway Square Waiting Shed. This historic structure once sat at Railway Square in Sydney CBD, which used to be a massive tram interchange until its closure in the 1950s. Truly a beautiful piece of architecture. Inside the Waiting Shed, you'll find a lot of old-fashioned ads. Truly a walk back in time. There's also the Liverpool Street Tramway signal box, which used to switch trams to the right line. Legend has it this very real man has stood inside the signal box for 100 years. Obviously a tramway museum is going to have trams as well. Amy and I were lucky enough to get to ride on one of the trams. So what do you think, so, so what do you think of this tram, Amy? I think it's really nice. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, I think the ads are nice. The old fashioned, the old fashioned ad, yeah. <laughs> now for a brief history of Sydney's trams. I'm not going to go into it in depth in this video, I'll be more detailed in a future video. But here's a brief summary. Trams, trams were, were introduced, introduced in, into Sydney, Sydney in 1879. 1879. Oh, it seems like real life Charlotte wants to talk. Ooh, okay, fine, you go ahead. Ugh. Back then, everyone lived closer together and no one owned cars. They didn't even exist yet. So trams were nice and a very convenient way for people to get to work. Take a look at this map of Sydney's former tram network. You used to be able to catch a tram just about anywhere, from Sydney CBD to Ryde, to The Spit, to Bondi, to La Perouse, to Canterbury. God, Sydney's network used to be one of the biggest tram networks in the world. Trams were so popular back then. But then, of course, unfortunately, cars came along and, you know, they were just seen as better. After all, cars could get people anywhere, anytime that they wanted. This was before global warming and the concepts of induced demand and all of that. So, you know, people just loved uh, cars and, of course, that, you know, was pretty much the death of trams. Trams were blamed for all the motor traffic that was happening. They used to get in the way of cars and so they were inevitably closed in favour of buses. The good news, of course, is that trams have made their return to Sydney. A very popular return, may I add, with three different routes existing today and a fourth about to open in Parramatta. Let's explore some of the many trams of the Sydney Tramway Museum. For example, we have this C-Class tram, the 290. Oh, right. Sydney had different classes of trams from C to R. This one was built in 1896. It's an electric tram, and it had benches along its sides which allowed for standing room in its centre. However, this design wasn't super conducive to capacity, so many trams like this were repurposed into work cars. This tram is in fact the oldest operational electric tram in Australia. Then there's this O-Class tram, the 805. This tram was built in 1905, and unlike the C-Class, it has cross benches that allowed for more sitting room. 
They kinda resembled toasters, so they were colloquially referred to as toast tracks. Next we have this beautiful R-Class tram, the 1740, built in 1933. This class of tram provided more protection for passengers due to its narrower doorways. It also offered better visibility for the driver, and it was just technically more advanced. These were the dominant tram when the network closed in 1961. This tram was the Vario tram, the first tram that operated on the new Piermont Light Rail line, which opened in 1997 and marked the return of trams to Sydney. Unlike past trams, this tram was a low floor tram, and it had articulated sections. I'm sure this is bringing back memories for anyone who rode the R1 line before 2015, when this model was withdrawn. We saw a bunch of other trams, such as this prison tram. Ah! Oh my god, why did they have that mannequin in there? I'd highly recommend going out to the Tramway Museum. Amy and I had so much fun looking at all the trams there, and everyone was so friendly. Okay, so what does the Sydney Tramway Museum have to do with the Royal National Park line? Well, when the branch line closed, they were very keen to take over the line. It did make sense. They were so close to the line. In fact, they'd been waiting to take it over for years. The plan was to not run trains on the railway, but trams. There were a few obstacles to overcome. The RTA had to rework the level crossing, and the railway had to be rewired for the trams that the museum owned. But it didn't take too long for them to iron out all the kinks. On the 1st of May 1993, the first tram ran down the Royal National Park Railway to the Royal National Park Station, and it's been running ever since. A regular tram service called Parklink has been running along the line every Sunday for years. Amy and I took a ride down the line on the 2001 tram, an R1 class tram with only minor differences to the R1740. Such a gorgeously restored tram, honestly. I can't believe we're in the bush right now. That is pretty cool. A tramway through the bush. This tram used to go in Sydney CBD, you know that? Really? Like in C Sydney CBD in like the actual city. And now look at us, now it's in, in the middle of the bush. Isn't that crazy? That's pretty crazy. It's like really nice that they restored it. It's so cool. Yeah. Ah, and then we arrived at the old station. Despite the old station platform remaining, we had to alight on the other side onto the ground because it's too high for the trams. It was so cool seeing people at a closed railway station. It's not often you see a closed station bustling just as much as it's back in its heyday. It's surreal, in fact it's magical, that this railway still sees passengers years and years after its closure. That's truly rare and truly special. Honestly, this has to be one of the best success stories I've ever seen of any abandoned railway station. In a series where I've explored so many different abandoned features, from abandoned railway cuttings through industrial parks, to incomplete bridges to nowhere, to expressways that were only built in bits and pieces, it's just crazy to see a railway station and a railway branch line that has been completely repurposed for continued modern use. What a success. So, it would be misleading for me to say that this line will forever remain lost to time, as I usually do. Because of the hard work of the Sydney Tramway Museum, this line has been given a second life. It could have been lost to time, but instead, it may forever be remembered by time.